This is Thomas Miles, nephew Tommy from the Steve Harvey Morning Show. As a radio personality, comedian, actor, and producer, I know what type of hard work and dedication it takes to make an impact in the world of arts and entertainment. Mac Performing Arts Collective, a nonprofit for visual and performing arts, is doing just that. Impact's mission is to cultivate the interests of visual and performing arts by exposing, educating, and entertaining. Impact is dedicated to the formation of avenues into the professional world of arts and entertainment through several of its programs, including It's a Wrap, Playhouse Theater, and Impact Jazz. Through these programs, Impact has launched film festivals, TV forums, music symposiums, comedy series, and showcases, jazz shows, theater productions, acting and comedy workshops, and much, much more. All in an effort to create platforms for emerging talent and create access to industry insiders in an effort for those seeking careers in arts and entertainment to be successful. As a proud member of its advisory board, I would like you to support Impact as a volunteer or as a donor. Please visit impact-arts.org today. Well, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to the Impact Virtual Speaker Series. First, I would like to give thanks to our incomparable J.D. Mack and our sponsor, Countrywide Financial, and welcome to the show. And our guest today is Mr. Avery Williams. Let me tell you a little bit about Avery. He is a screenwriter, director, and professor with an MFA from New York University to School of the Arts. In 2022, he directed the pilot episode for the Emmy-nominated digital series, Intersection, which premiered on PBS WAVE TV. He co-directed the feature film's Misguided Behavior and Scanned. As a screenwriter, Avery co-wrote the feature directing Eddie, voted Best Comedy, 2001 New York International Independent Film and Video Festival. The short film, The Willie Witch Projects, distributed by Trimark Pictures in the compilation of the Bogus Witch Project and the award-winning short Notes in a Minor Key for Hollywood Pictures. He has written six plays that have been produced for the theater and he co-produced Eve Ensler's The Vaginal Monologues, directed by Penny Marshall in 2005 and Penny Johnson Gerald 2006, as well as Tom Cole's Medal of Honor rag, starring Heavy D, directed by Delroy Lindo, and executive produced by Will Smith. He is one of the founding faculty members of the Cinema, Television, and Emerging Media Studies Department at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, where he currently serves as an assistant professor. Um, so Avery, good morning, good afternoon. And good afternoon and good or good morning where it's being shown, but uh, thank you. Welcome. Yes, 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 yes. So before I go through this list of questions, is there anything you want to tell us that maybe I didn't cover in your bio? No, just, I mean, I just always want to shout out to my students um, at Morehouse College, you know, that's um, they're my heart, you know, as well as Spellman and Clark, you know, but that's about it. <laughs> we can talk about a lot of things, but I always want to give them love. Okay. All right. So can you share a bit about your background and journey as a writer and filmmaker? Sure. Um, I actually began a few years after I graduated from Morehouse when I was trying to figure out um, exactly what I wanted to do in life. And like a lot of college students you uh, who are graduated, you're not exactly sure. I majored in English, but I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with that. So at one point I was actually going to law school when suddenly a lightning bolt hit me and the lightning bolt came in the form of a guy named Spike Lee. And uh, what that did, Spike had just produced his first film, She's Gotta Have It. But more importantly, he had actually published a book called Spike Lee's Gotta Have It, which, chronicled his whole journey from his first failed film called Messenger to the success of She's Gotta Have It. I read that book and I read it like intensely. It was like being uh, like, like a whole new world opened up to me. And what world opened up to me was to for me to recognize that this whole making movies and the Hollywood business was something 
accessible, something that perhaps I could do. So what did I do? I actually applied to film school and I applied to NYU. Uh, it, it, it's the uh, same way Spike did. And um, God blessed me and I was accepted. They had uh, over 400 applications that year and they only accepted 20 people. And I happened to be one of those. And so I packed up my show from Atlanta um, and, and moved everything to New York. And once I got to New York, you know, and I um, lived on the Upper West Side and I started to go to NYU and I attended Tisch School of the Arts at NYU, uh, it was a, a whole new world. I'd given up the, you know, the, uh, the, the soft leather briefcase and the, and, the, and the suits and traded in for a backpack, jeans and, and T-shirts. That was my life. And I lived it to its fullest because I, I recognized that I had a, a purpose and I recognized that you know, I had a passion. And so while I was in film school, one of the great things that happened to me is that um, right near the end of, um, before I even graduated, a, a, a friend of mine who was in the writing and uh, directing program said, hey man, I need a script for my thesis film. And I said, I got an idea. And I wrote the, um, the story of a jazz man in Harlem who was just dying to get out, set in 1947. He read the script, loved it, and said, hey, look, let's, let's see if we can make this into a movie. Well, at the time, we had no money. We had, how are we going to do this, you know, right? But this is the way uh, God works, you know, that, that we, uh, we asked and, and God gave. And he gave in the form of uh, Hollywood Pictures, or, uh, or I'm sorry, um, um, yeah, it was Hollywood Pictures. Um, uh, which was a, a Disney company from Buena Vista was all connected. But I, I, an exec named Tracy Kimball had just received money as a creative exec from Jeffrey Katzenberg to go find the new Jack writers, the new Jack directors, because they were complaining that they could never get hold of these, the, these new talent, these emerging talents before everybody else glommed on them. So Ge Jeffrey Katzenberg gave him $150,000 and said, go out there and find a new talent. Tracy came to New York put her ears to the ground, said, hey, what's going on here? What, what are you all doing at, at, at NYU? And everybody talked about the fact that here's Avery Williams and his partner, um, uh, Adisa Septuri, which his name was there, was Richard Jones, but it's uh, Adisa Septuri, um, were doing this period piece. And she said, hey, I'm, this sounds interesting. But she wouldn't tell us who she was. So she, But she read the script, came back and said, I love it. Said, can I take you guys to, to breakfast? Now, look, we were broke grad students. We didn't have any money. So yeah, so taking us to a Manhattan breakfast was <laughs> with me. We took us to breakfast, sat down, and she said, um, uh, I love it. How do you all plan on producing this? And I had some ideas. I said, we're, we're going to try to get an, um, a period car, put a, a wig on a guy's he head, have him drive one way down the street, tell him turn around, take the wig off and drive the other way. We would edit them together and that would create traffic in 1947, some stuff like that. You know, I was really kind of spitballing the ideas, but she loved the idea. She loved the fact that NYU, um, at, at the time, the Dean Mary Schmidt Campbell, was, was the dean of it. They were, they were so behind students and supportive. So she said, yes, we would like to be in, in bed with you guys. And I said, well, who are you? And she introduced herself as um, a creative exec from Hollywood Pictures. And she would give us to the tune of, of twelve of $14,000 to do this film. Now, that was a lot then. But our relationship grew wonderfully as uh, the studio got very interested in this film. She got very interested in it. We started putting on stars like Harry Lennox and Keith David, uh, music by Gerald Albright. We started laying, layering all these things in there that Disney ended up giving us close to $50,000 to do this short. It's called Notes in a Minor Key. And that sort of really launched me. And um, Ali, at the time, I, I we became the, the flavor of the weekend, you know. Um, we were written up in the LA Times, the New York Times. Um, we were the, they won awards on the East Coast and the West Coast. And it was really that thing, you know, and, and that, 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 that helped um, move me to a, to a particular level. But they say, God laughs when man plans, you know. And I thought I was just going to go on to do big studio works after that. But that didn't quite happen. My career ended up shifting and I went into what's called the gospel play business. And at the time, these were these huge plays that, that most of the world knows that Tyler Perry is, came from. But this guy um, named Michael Matthews, who was really the, the godfather of, of these plays, um, saw notes in the minor key. And he had the genius idea of taking one of his plays and making it into a movie. 
brilliant. I was like, well, Mike, I'm going on to Hollywood to do Hollywood stuff. And, and then, of course, it was a what did he do? He said, here's some money. <laughs> make my play. I would make my play into a movie. And I was like, OK. So I ended up staying in New York. And then I wrote. I did that. I made his first move uh, play into a, a, a movie. I wrote it. And then it was time for me to say, OK, I need to go to Hollywood. He laid on some more money. So I ended up staying in that business. And then one day Mike comes to me and says, hey, look, how about how would you like to be company manager of a play? You know, and I said, um, Mike, I know nothing about managing a play, you know, especially on a national basis like that. He said, well, look, if you could produce a film for Disney, you could manage this play. And again, what? Mo dollars, you know, right. <laughs> and so. I got, I was drawn into it. And there I met some amazing people. Um, uh, they were, they were um, um, Thomas Miles, um, nephew Tommy, uh, well, ended up being my roommate, one of my closest friends. Um, uh, who else? Um, uh, you know him now as Mary Mary. Um, and and uh, it, it was just a bunch of people that were just growing and, 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 and part of this business. So I stayed in there and I ended up actually even writing a couple of plays myself. Um, one was What a Woman Will Do for Love. The other one was A Mother's Prayer. Uh, one was starring um, Raven Simone. And then so after just a few years, after about six years of that, I said, hey, look, I've got to, I, I, I got sort of burnt out and I, I got to get back to what I'm doing. And one guy I had, I had written a script for while I was in film school, he was a rapper. Uh, he said, hey, man, he said, why don't you get back to what you're supposed to be doing and that's writing these movies. I said, I said, brother, I don't know anybody in Hollywood anymore. I've been away for six years. He said, don't worry, I got you. That guy was Heavy D. And so Heavy said, so I went out to Hollywood and Heavy connected me. The first one was with Master P and then it was with uh, Damon Dash. And then it just sort of snowballed, you know, to with, with, with a bunch of people that he knew. Now, what was I doing at the time? I was writing scripts for these people. You know, and, and unfortunately, a lot of these scripts they weren't they didn't get made you know but they got written and i had a fairly comfortable life just writing scripts for a lot of hollywood luminaries black luminaries for the most part and then in 2008 the writer strike hit and then all of a sudden all the work went away they weren't making movies for anybody now, now see that was the first writer strike that most people now um, are, aren't necessarily aware of this was in 2008 after 2008, um, I was out of work. And so I looked for some work. And the, the only thing that was popping was reality TV. And I made a few calls and I jumped into reality TV. And I started off as a production coordinator um, and on a show called Keisha Cole, The Way It Is. And so yeah. I did Keisha Cole and I did a bunch of other shows. And they're all sort of based in Atlanta, you know. And um, and I kept coming from to flying from LA to Atlanta to do these shows. So I eventually came, I eventually became a production manager for these shows. And then while I was at, in Atlanta, um, and I eventually moved to Atlanta because it only made sense to do that, Morehouse said, hey, look, we need some promos, some video promos that look real cool for, for our school. And so I produced and directed some of those. And then after a while, they, they, they were starting a new film program. And the dean of this program, Dean Terry Mills, said, hey, look, I want to start a film program. Would you be interested in being on a advisory board. And I was like, sure. So I sat on the advisory board for a whole year. Now, so I'm doing reality TV, sitting on the advisory board for Morehouse, shooting promos. So I'm doing a lot of cool stuff. And then he said, hey, look, are you, would you be interested in teaching any of these courses you helped develop? And I always thought, Ali, that I would be a professor maybe one. I thought it might be in the winter of my years. You know, I would be wearing an ascot and smoking a pot. <laughs> You know, that guy, it'd be all gray, you know, but I didn't think it would be like in the um, mid fall of my years, you know, but I said yes. And so I did. And and I fell in love with it. And then what was be beautiful about the whole thing, then my independent career started taking off to, in terms of directing independent films and, and other smaller projects. But Morehouse let me teach and work these things at the same time. And 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 as long as it didn't interfere with my teaching and my service to Morehouse, then they were all the blessings were there. And it still remains to this day that they let me do what I, what I do, but still bring on uh, my students. And that's the story. <laughs> and that's awesome. It seems like your path was divinely guided. You know, I mean, the, all the doors that open to you that don't open, I guess, ordinarily to to people. You know, they were just kind of like, here you go. Do yeah. that. Here's this opportunity. Shine. You know, 
you know, and then I would say that, that yes, the divinely guided, but also guided with the with the pressure with the good pressure of my mother and 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 a lot of and the and the women in my life, you know, including my wife, you know, they um, that whole idea of of pushing me to constantly keep going. I've always felt my mother's hand on the back of on, on my back. Matter of fact, if I look in, on in, on my back, I probably see her handprint. But that has always been a a constant in my life. Someone who believes in you and supports you. Oh my all- gosh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Like my uh, wife, my sisters, all, you know, right, all of them. They've been all there for me. That's amazing. So as a professor at Morehouse, I think you probably have already answered this, but let me go ahead and ask the question anyway. How do you integrate your experiences in the industry into your teaching? And what key lessons do you emphasize for aspiring writers and filmmakers? I, well, one of the things, and I think hopefully that's what the blessing I can bring to uh, Morehouse and to Spelman is that, um, and to Emory, I'm sorry, let's, let's not give up this. I also teach at Emory University um, every other semester. I um, I bring a real world experience. Uh, yeah. For example, I, it's, I, I'm working with a network right now on, on a film that will hopefully be shot within the next couple of months or next month or so. And all of my negotiations and my studio notes and all the stuff, I come and tell the students, hey, look, these are the notes they gave me on this. This is what I'm going through right now. So they are, are experiencing this with me real time and nothing that they saw on TMZ or, you know, or a tweet or something like that. But they actually are hearing it from the professor who's dealing with it. So so the real world experiences are part of my pedagogy um, as, as a professor. Oh, that's awesome. So um, you did already answer this question, but I'll ask in case you want to embellish. What inspired you to pursue a career in both academia and the creative field? And how do these two aspects complement each other in your life? Creatively, um, I can say that it, it starts. It started when I was young. My mother was a big let's go to the movies, let's watch the movies. And my mother was not, I mean, she's she's a a black woman from Chicago. So she didn't keep, she didn't hold her tongue. If she didn't like something up on the screen or like a star or or she would say, but if she did like something, you know, my mom today is the biggest fan of Turner classic movies, you know, right? So getting that nurturing was, I think, started the beginning. And then like I told you in 1986, Spike really sort of lit a fuse. And okay. and the whole teaching thing, I don't know. That that I think that's more of a a, a, a giving back, a divine. It, it it it. Here's the thing: I have daughters, but I don't have any sons. You know, and so as such, all my students, especially those at Morehouse, end up becoming my sons. Mm-hmm. You know, but also it's it's their sons, but also brothers too, because I tell them I sat in the very same seats that you all are sitting in now. I know stuff y'all deal with. I know the crap you, you, you're trying to pull, you know, because I tried to pull it myself. So it's not, we on the same page. So there's a wonderful covenant there that we share. That's funny. You were talking about your, your mother being outspoken about whether when she liked movies or it reminds me of going to see a certain movie that premiered here in, uh, in Houston. And my sister won tickets through the radio station. I don't know how she used to always win tickets. So we got to walk the red carpet with uh, Tommy Lee Jones, uh, Clint Eastwood, James Garner, and um, Donald Sutherland. I'm not going to name the movie, but I'll name the actors. Okay. <laughs> so we're sitting on the on the first row, and I'm watching it, and I'm thinking, okay, well, first of all, this is sort of a rip off of Armageddon, but I'll let it slide. Mm-hmm. But at the end, and this is me, who no filter. And these stars are actually on the back row. And I'm literally on the front row with my sister, like kissing the screen. And, and I look back and I was like, that ending sucked. And my sister was like, no, you can't say that. I'm like, no, they need to go back and reshoot that ending. That ending was horrible. That, right. makes sense. that was horrible. That was very much a letdown. That was bad. And my sister was like, oh my God, I can't take you anywhere. And <laughs> like, you know, I just, I looked at that and I was just like, I like all these actors. Yeah. And I like what they tried to do. Right. That ending scene was like, did y'all run out of money? <laughs> what happened? You okay. know, it was, you know, so I, I, I'm with your mom on that. You know, right. like, I like it, don't like it. That's just, that's just what right. it is. And you, and you voiced, and you voiced your opinion. You know, right. With them on the back row. And she was like, they'll hear you. I'm like, they need to. Hello. <laughs> Like it was bad. It was it was bad, in a funny kind of way, but it was bad. So, 
Uh, can you highlight a specific project or work that you feel particularly proud of? And what challenges did you overcome during its creation besides budget <laughs> financing? It's always <laughs> It's always that, but that's always a you know challenge. But here's one of the more recent ones. It's called Intersection. It was produced by an, an amazing uh, producer named Meg Mesmer. And Meg was one of those, I, I stumbled into her um, at one of these uh, writer seminars that was going on in Atlanta. And, and what had happened, Meg had brought um, a, a manager, a literary manager in to talk with people. And she was just sort of the person that introduced the manager, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. But Meg was so impressive as a person and, and her knowledge of film that I went up and talked to her. Here's what she told me she and a group of other actresses were creating a limited series on gentrification because Meg is a white woman and, and was a gentrifier. She had gentrified in, in LA and then Detroit and then now Atlanta, you know, and so she recognized that this is a sort of a, a thing, you know, right? <laughs> you don't think? And so they got together and they want to create a limited series. And I pitched to her, I said, hey, look, well, you know, I'm a, I'm, uh, you know what I do as a writer and a screenwriter. She, had, uh, you know, I'd introduce myself. And I said, if you ever want me to just read over some of the scripts you've all written, feel free. Well, a couple of months later, she did. She reached out to me and sent me the scripts. And we had this wonderful conversations going on back and forth about the scripts they had written for these, for this limited series. Well, along the way, Meg said that I would really love this to be like an Emmy quality work, you know, and at the time I was like, okay, whatever, you know, it's just another work. Let's, uh, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. And so um, at, at, at some point in the process, when they were about to shoot, she said, she, she said, hey, you're a director. Would you be interested in directing one of these episodes? And I said, sure. I said, but I want the hardest episode, which was the pilot. Give me the hardest one. I wanted, I'd like to direct that. And sure enough, she did it. Um, produced the heck out of it. She and the rest of her her, her, her group did a, an amazing job. And lo and behold, after it was done and, 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 and said and done, a few months later, we get the announcement that uh, one of the actresses in uh, Intersection had been nominated for an Emmy. You know, all right. I was like, now, so why am I proud of that? I'm proud of it because one, I introduced myself to their process, but did it, you know, in a very humble sort of way by serve, to how can I serve you or how can I help you all? And then that the way it just sort of came back to, well, here, um, then why don't you direct this this, this episode? And, and just to work with a good producer is phenomenal. And then somebody who has a vision was was great. And then whatever I could bring to, so it felt like a really wonderful collaboration. And so that's, and that's just fairly recent, you know, and, and, it's also the the whole digital media thing I really dig because I, I preach that to my students that, hey, look, don't wait on the studios. Go out, produce your thing because you have this, uh, the, this distribution network called the internet that can distribute your work right away. And that's just what they did. So I, I'm, 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 high, I'm happy about that particular work. Gotcha. So for aspiring writers and filmmakers, what is the most crucial piece of advice you wish someone had given you when you were starting your journey? To understand that my your vision, here's the thing. When I first started writing, I was actually writing these huge multi-million dollar budgeted films. They were wonderful stories, but no one was going to produce those because it was like as a first time writer, they weren't going to really take a chance on it. I did not learn to write low budget until later on. Now, low budget doesn't mean low quality. Right. It just means that you are writing with certain parameters in place that will enable it, the, uh, the possibility of this getting made to be a lot easier than this space uh, uh, sci-fi, you know, time traveling adventure that you may have written before. I didn't learn. It took me a while to realize that. And that's one of the things I, I tell students. I say, look, if you really want to get these made, you have to get them made in mind with 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 a, with a dollar amount, you know, because that's that's the reality. And so if you can learn to write. Small, but with quality, that's probably the best overall bit of advice I can give a, a writer jumping into this. OK, OK. So how do you approach storytelling to make your work stand out? And what elements do you believe contribute to a, creating a memorable narrative? 
Okay, well, you've heard this phrase, write what you know, right? A lot of people, well, I can't do this, the sci-fi thing. I don't, I mean, you know, right. Can I, I can't write about being a, a, a you know, a, a, a transgender woman in, in Seattle. No, Cause I don't know that. No, that's not what that phrase means. Write what you know, right? Means write what you know inside in terms of your feelings. Um, do you understand maybe a, 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 a time that you may have felt alienated or a time that where you felt um, overjoyed. These are universal traits that um, transcend the, 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 you know, the, the, the uh, who, you, what you look like, where you live, what time period, all of the sort of trappings of of how we perceive life. It's it's how we experience life is what's common, and that's what you. you know, so so write what you know, and if you know joy, then there's no problem about you writing the joy of, you know, of a child who was um, uh, uh, looking to be adopted and, and, and now finds a family, you know, because if you understand what joy is, then you can, you can write that particular story. So that's my approach these days, is to understand that movies are about what, how it makes us feel. You know, a lot of times we don't remember the plot. Matter of fact, it's like music. I don't remember the lyrics half the time. My wife gets on me because I don't know no lyrics, right? But I know how it makes me feel, right? And if right. you could tap into that feeling and get that, then that's where the gold is. And you're talking about lyrics. When I was growing up back in the day, <laughs> um, my dad, being a, a local musician, would have me to write down the lyrics to songs that he was doing the covers for. Mm -hmm. So literally that that meant that I had to lift the needle up <laughs> to pause it, right. and put it back to where. So I'm, I'm very lyric driven, you know, okay. so I listen to lyrics before I listen to everything else. Really? Yeah. 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 That's 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 the thing. I can quote you lyrics. I can quote, you know, commercials from way back when, you know, I was telling my mom about tuna twist makes tuna taste fresh <laughs> in the garden from way back. I mean, that stuff is kind of ingrained in my head. So. Right. But I get, I get, and by the way, um, to the people that are listening, I sort of know Avery because he gave me script coverage. Oh, uh, okay, uh, right. <laughs> what about that? Yes. On one of my projects, no, he actually he gave me some really good, uh, really good feedback on a project, and then kind of as a just a person that I know read another project it for me. So I mean, I I trust him. He's a he's a great source of of. of criticism, you know, a gentle nudging, like maybe you want to go in this direction or I didn't really feel comfortable with that saying, you might want to rethink it. I mean, it, 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 it helps as a, as a, a writer to have someone to give you honest script coverage. Don't give it to Pookie Nam or whoever's <laughs> going to agree with you and mm -hmm. say your vision is good. Kind of like those people that were coming on Star Search and it's like they've been you know, vetted by all of their scouts and they get on and they sound like who did and what for and you're like, who told you that you could sing? Who who did that? Why weren't they honest with you? Avery's honest. I, I, I trust him with what he has to say. So in your experience, how has the landscape of writing and filmmaking changed over the years? And what advice do you have for staying relevant in a dynamic industry? Okay, sure. I think it's changed over the years. Uh, it used to be that back in the early or the mid 80s, they, the, the screenwriting was like, oh, write a screenplay, get a million dollars. That ain't happening these days, you know, right? Uh, movies are hard to get to, uh, to get made. I think that the key here is that you that people forget about the fact that, I mean, we, we, we see these high budget movies, but we forget there are mid-level and low budget movies that have to be written. Somebody has to put pen to paper or type them up, whatever it is that your method is. There are a lot of those that are being made, a lot of those that are being, and, and they need quality writers. Um, I think the landscape has also changed through, through, through the internet. I love these whole digital series and digital uh, and, and the digital platform. Um, I always tell my students, if you haven't, you see Issa Rae's success, but if you haven't seen um, the misadventures of an awkward black girl, make sure you see that. This is a digital series that she did that really, got her in a lot of ways on the map that wasn't available 10 15 years ago you know but now you have it here you can actually create a work that the world can actually see but it has to be written well it doesn't necessarily have to be 
produced with like all the bells and whistles. If you see Awkward Adventures, uh, Misadventures of a Black Girl, I think I'm saying it right, The Misadventures of an Awkward Black Girl, you would see that production wise, it's, you know, it's, it's got some, it's not, you know, it's gonna need some work, you know, right. She didn't have a lot of money, obviously, but her sense of character and situation and her, and the execution of character, it worked. And then, and, and that, I, I, and I give her huge thumbs up to that. So anyway, my point being is that, to answer your question, yes, um, um, we have high budget films, we got the Marvel movies and all that kind of stuff. That's one thing. But then you have a whole lot of lower budget films that people are buying and paying for and they need writers for. Go for those. Don't be afraid of those. And then also this whole digital media area is, is a wonderful frontier to explore. Awesome. Awesome. So um, how crucial is collaboration in the world of writing and filmmaking? And what advice do you have for building a strong network in the industry? All right. Now, as a writer, and believe it or not, <laughs> my mother will tell you this. I'm, I'm an, uh, well, let me just be wrong. My mother will tell you, I'm an introvert by nature. Um, and, but that can be kind of, that can work against me in a lot of ways, you know, I mean, if, um, you know, I hear about a party or something that people are gathering. I'm like, oh, I really don't want to go. It, it, I have to push myself to go. I mean, to be honest with you, even this interview, if this didn't happen, I'd be like, okay, it didn't happen. That's cool. Right. I would have just sat on the couch and then, you know, pulled up my laptop and done what I did. But I'm glad you were here, Allie, you know, and, 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 and um, Jaylene and everybody made it happen. So I'm glad to be here. So let me answer your question. Uh, collaboration is key in this business because you are, cannot create great works by trying to be a one man band. All right. You cannot this you cannot play all the instruments, you know, sure. Not not everybody's a prince. You know, right. And even he had some wonderful people working with him to get the work out. If you want your work out, you've got to start to collaborate and work with people. And look, writers, I'm telling you especially, don't be afraid to share your work with other writers. You know, um, Allie shared her work with me. I mean, it may have been uncomfortable, but she got outside that comfort zone and said, here, and then, you know, and I gave it back to her, you know, all right, in terms of my, my, my criticism. So yeah, so collaboration is key to success. And in terms of this whole connectivity thing, yeah, we, we have to meet people. There's so many projects and things going on that we just aren't aware of. And we aren't aware of because we keep meeting and talking with the same group of people all the time. We don't step outside of our comfort zones. You know, I, I need to come to Houston and see what they're doing there in Houston, you know, right? And the Houston people need to come here to Atlanta and then we need to go to LA and, you know, and what's happening in Louisiana. All that is is about a connection and finding out and, and, and the ability to work together. So collaboration is important connections and meeting people, even if you're uncomfortable, if you're, you're an introvert like me, push past that discomfort and make it happen. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, th those are awesome comments. Um, talking about collaborating with you or having you do script coverage for me, I, I, I'm hearing Miss Badu in my in my ears saying, because I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my... Yes. <laughs> so how important or how does ego work for you and against you and or against you in this industry? Because I mean, everybody's protective of their babies to a certain degree. And I guess that may be ego involved in that or you think, oh, well, they just don't understand the story, which means it didn't translate on paper or translate on screen, correct? But do you feel like ego works for us or against us? Oh, and yeah. oh I think that um, um, the ego can, can build you up, but also it can block you too at the same time. You know, like I think you should have a certain amount of ego. Like I, I can do this. I am, I'm the the a s h i. I can, you know, make it happen. And that's fine. But at the same time, be careful about that ego that that will make you deaf or blind to um, improvement or things that could. Uh, like, like the case in point, I'm right. I told you I'm writing something for a network now, and and it's and I I went through five six rounds of drafts, and every draft they, they the, the producer sent back, they had notes on it that and 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 I just wanted to uh, to scream not scream it wasn't that bad, but I was like ah kill this uh, cut cut this scene kill this character I was like you you all don't get it, but you know what they do get it. Why do they get it? Because they are in the business of producing movies and they know what it takes to produce it. So as soon as I allow my ego to kind of step back and say, okay, let's, let me learn how y'all do things. 
And then, and then sudden, then now I'm seeing that, yeah, uh, right, uh, the end of July, what month are we in right now? No, it, it, yeah, March, April, end of April, this movie actually will go into production, you know? And so the key is, is you've got to be careful. You've got to check your ego at the door. Don't worry about it. It'll get you to the door, but be careful. When you, when you go inside, let it hang outside and, and be willing to learn, willing to always be a student. I tell my students at all the time, I say, I'm learning from y'all. Let me learn from y'all. Teach me something. So, right. There it is. Yeah, we never we never do stop learning, you know. It's better not. Tell me that when I was, and I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, of course, you know, you discover, okay, grandma was wiser than I, you know, I gave her credit for. And I, I right. hear myself <laughs> echoing some of the things she used to tell me as a kid. It's like, yeah, always being the perpetual sponge, you know, and, and checking the ego at the door for sure. There it is. Um, so can you share any strategies for overcoming creative blocks or challenges that writers and filmmakers currently or commonly face? Yes, I can. Let me tell you the number one thing. Put this down. <laughs> Put this down. I'm so, look, I'm not one of these, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm a, uh, young people listen to me now, like, oh man, uh, what OG. Somebody called me an OG uh, the other day. I was walking past campus and like, yo, OG. And I was like, oh, gee, what? I mean, is, is that me? But anyway, I, I digress. So Allie, I'm not against um, social media or, or all the information that comes from the phone. But what I want people to do is to start to exercise this powerful computer here. And so to get past writer's block, sometimes I say, you know what? Turn off the TV, put down the phone, and look out the darn window. And just think and allow yourself, the, the, uh, allow God to speak to you. Allow the muse to, to visit you. Allow that creativity that's born with you. Allow that, 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 that creative muscle to exercise itself a little bit. And then to say, what if? What if? What if? And I think if you if, if if writers would allow that moment to happen, just kind of shut out the noise, I think they would find that the voice inside of them will, will speak. You know, you're feeling like uh, somewhat that smartphones are kind of dumbing us down or cutting down, cutting down our attention. I mean, I do know attention span wise, it's <clears throat> some of the audiences of, of today, today want the want the immediate payout. It's like if yes. you don't. Get in the first couple of minutes, pages, or whatever, then they're on to the next thing. Oh, most so. definitely. You know, matter of fact, there is a sense. I, I, I look. I've been teaching for ten years now, and I think that I've recognized that I've, I've come to the conclusion that the creative muscle is relatively has become weakened with with, with today's young people. And why I say that is because I, I will pitch them. I, I see them literally struggling to come up with ideas, or if they do have an idea, how to change an idea. And I think that the reason for this is this, is that you know, in 2017, you could not be a teenager in the United States, an average teenager in the United States, if you did not have a smartphone. And what that means is that this is a whole generation that has grown up with a screen in front of their face. I mean, when the kids are playing or, or, or you know, mom and dad or they'll start complaining, what does mom do? Here, take my phone, you know, or here, sit in front of this iPad or sit in front of this TV. In other words, they're constantly being fed information. They're constantly being, uh, it's projected onto them, but they don't allow work the muscle that allows them to project onto something else. For example, if there was a box, a huge box, and they gave it to Allie, said, Allie, play with this box. Well, Allie may make a, 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 you know, a coffee shop out of it or a dollhouse out of that box. Avery may make a, a like it's going to be a spaceship. My honest belief is that if I gave a box to today's kids and said, here, play, and with the instructions, play with the box, they'd do one or two things. They would either Google how to play with a box, right? Or they would ask AI, AI, I've been asked how to play with a box. Can you give me 10 suggestions of playing with a box? I honestly see that because I will ask a question in class and my student, that they don't know the answer, they will immediately start, I, I say, don't go to Google. Just I'll take a moment and try to think about the answer yourself. So this, hap this, this is part of that creative muscle that is not exercised enough. Because they're, 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 because they're not challenged enough to do it. Because things do come easy. Information comes so easy. And now with AI, it's coming so easy that uh, 
that that I'm 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 really concerned that it is weakening the muscles in a lot of ways. Yeah, I agree. Oh, I, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. All right. Look, I, I'm I'm of the like didn't didn't Terminator and and uh, and Matrix warn us about that stuff? Y'all oh, not sure. <laughs> yeah, Skynet dissension. Yeah, right. You know, right. Oh, sure. Right, listen, they already told you. Um, so as someone who has worked on diverse projects, how do you navigate the balance between personal creative expression and meeting the expectations of a broader audience? That kind of leads from the, the previous question. Yeah. Of the, <laughs> now, that, that is tricky, you know, but you look, uh, Jesus said it best. You give unto Caesar what is Caesar, give unto God what is God, you know, right? So you have to be able to, you know, to say, hey, look, I'm going to, if I'm writing for this network and this is what they want, do that. But at the same time, it's carve time for your own particular projects. It's the same way at Moyd Morehouse. Um, one of my, uh, uh, my my dear friends and, and colleagues, Dr. Stephanie Dunn, and I always talk about the fact that we love what we do as professors in the cinema, television, and emerging media studies program. But at the same time, we also love what we do as creative individuals. And we must carve out time to do that. You know, it, you just have to. I mean, I, I'll stay up to, you know, sometimes one, two o'clock in the morning working on my own stuff because that balances the stuff that I have to do, either for the network, the studio or the school. Because Avery has to fit himself in there sometime, you know. And it's it's hard to do sometimes. I mean, yeah, you, yeah that's it's you literally have to make the time is it's not going to just be laid in your lap if you're staying busy. Yeah. I mean, and you're I mean, sounds like your plate run it over at this point. So you definitely have to say, okay, you know what? I'm tired. I can really sleep right now, but let me get this out on my stuff. Yeah. You know, otherwise it'll just keep getting back burnered and back burnered and back burnered. And then you'll be feeling bad because you didn't get it done. So um hey let me add to this because that this is a good friend of mine. Um her uh, her name is Shannon Hampton. She she's passed away now. She came to visit me while I was one year out of college, she and her sister and some other friends. And I was living in an apartment in Atlanta and in, in, um, Virginia Highlands, I had a little, small little apartment, one bedroom. And she, they came down from Chicago and they were in my living room and I was working for the city of Atlanta and I had to get up the next morning and they were all in the living room making noise. And so I came out and said, hey, 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 look, stop all that noise. I got to, I got to get to work in the morning, right? Well, her sister, uh, Tracy, was like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We know you got to go to work. Well, Shannon, being the feisty little Chicago woman she was, she said, look, uh, some people, and I mean, some things and some people are worth being tired for. I never forgot that lesson. Some things are worth being tired for. So, I, you know, I talk, I still sometimes like things about tired. I'm like, okay, well, and? Right. Right, <laughs> well, right. Right. Some things are worth being, I mean, we're going to be tired. So, Hey, push through it, figure out how to get a nap in, but keep on going. Some things are worth being tired for. I'll never forget she said that. That's awesome. That's that's the that's a good good nugget to to file away. Like, okay, some things are worth be, uh, being tired for. Mm -hmm. I have a friend named Charles Williams that I went to school with, and mm -hmm. he said because he does a lot with editing and, and entertainment and he said it wasn't like work for him because he was doing what he loved mm, yeah. and so it wasn't like you know like being on a nine to five you know that you hate or that you're bearing you know dealing with to the best of your ability because right. he was working 12 hours a day he was doing what he loved so it wasn't like work so i like that some things are worth being tired for and <laughs> if you're doing what you love it's not really work you're right about that that is true you're doing what yeah. you love you know so how important do you believe it is for writers and filmmakers to embrace technology and new media in the contemporary storytelling landscape? Okay. I don't particularly like the thought of AIs writing scripts, but, you know, that's just me. I, no, 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 I get it. And I don't want and I don't like the idea either. But I think that we have to be aware, you know, of, of certain things. All right. So technology. All right. It's, it's, it's not going away. It's part and parcel of who we are. So I guess the key is to be able to always harness it and make it work for you. So if you are a, a cameraman, you know, you've got to know about the, all the latest cameras and sensors and all that kind of stuff. If you are an editor, you know, you have to not only learn Adobe Premiere, but also Final Draft or Final Cut, excuse me. And, and so in other words, 
you have to, this is part of the world and you just have to be a part of it. And now as a writer, yeah, we have to be aware of Grammarly and, 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 uh, and, and chat GBT. And now Google has Gemini, you know, right. And, and, and know that they exist, know how to use them, make use of it. If, if it helps you in some sort of way, you know, but at the same time, never, ever forget that God has given you the greatest technological tool that has ever been, and that is our mind. Use that and work with that. And trust me, you will go a lot further than you were than trying to just, you know, press a button on something. Right, else. right. I, I guess in, in my mind, those, those uh, technological advancements are kind of like the smartphone. Yeah. And to some degree, they may be still dumbing us down a little bit. You know, I don't think that, that, I mean, yeah, learning to operate them is one thing, but then once they start doing the work for you, you know, in my yeah. mind. No, no, I, and I agree with you. I think that, that it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. I think that, that every generation faces it. I mean, you know, it's the same way when, I guess when they, you know, speaking of, it's the same way that studios felt very threatened when television came on you know they were like oh that's it that's the end of of movies as it is because everybody's gonna stay at home and watch the little box you know and then they were concerned about the threat of the tv and they came up with all sorts of devices you know we're gonna do drive-in theaters we're gonna do widescreen we're gonna you know do they, you know they even had something called smell-o-vision like you'd be in the theaters and and we would let go of some smells you could smell it they tried everything because they were thinking they were afraid of it so i get that concern that we have about this technology. But I um, I do also believe, though, that humanity will win out. You know, maybe I'm an optimist, you know, but that's the approach I have to take. And that humanity will find its way always into our art. May, the pendulum may swing crazily one day, but hopefully the, our humanity will swing it back. Okay. All right. Great answer. So are there specific habits or practices that you think contribute to long-term success in the creative field? And how do you maintain consistency in your work? Okay, that's a good question. I First think of all, one or two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, well, if that's what it takes. But I mean, you've got to put in the hours, you know, right. you've got to, you've got to what's called eat that frog, you know, whatever, whatever the hardest thing is, you've got to do it. And that means do it now. There's one thing that, you know, um, uh, they, they're not making no more. Uh, uh, God's not making any more land, or and, and and or any more time. There's 24 hours in this day. So all right. So what are you going to do? With I used to love to hear stories. Heaven used to tell me great stories of of people in this business. Like he told me, he, he said Will Smith is probably one of the hardest working people that he's ever met. Um, uh, Puffy used to come back from a party at 2 a.m. in the morning, go go into his office if he had an idea and work on something. And then um, even like friends of mine, like David Talbert, who um, who tells me who came to my class and, and, and talked to students. I'll never forget what he said. He said that he said there are smarter directors than me, smarter writers, but no one's going to beat my hustle. I will work my butt off, you know. And then finally, my good uh, frat brother and, and friend Will Packer always talks about the fact that, look, you've just got to not be afraid and go for it. So what are we talking about? Put in the hours, work hard, and push past the fear. Those are the tools. Gotcha. So as a as a, a professor, I'm sure this, this is probably applies in the classroom for you and outside of the classroom for you. But what role does mentorship play in the development of a writer or a filmmaker and how can individuals seek and benefit from mentorship opportunities? All right. So <clears throat> mentorship, everybody's, uh, you know, and I've had to come to me like, hey, can you be my mentor? Can you be, my, you know, and, 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 and I think that sort of thing happens organically. I think the first step for if I want to achieve mentorship is basically what you want to say. I want to learn under somebody is go get a book. Go in there and, and believe it or not, there are some people who have been incredibly successful in this business that have poured out their knowledge in this business into a book. Open it up and read it, not just the first chapter, but read the darn thing all the way through. I told you all how Spike influenced me. Spike has since been a mentor to me. And yeah, we, we've met each other. We kind of casually know each other every once in a while. You know, he went to Morehouse and all and NYU. But the thing about it, I got to know who that man's voice through that book that he wrote. Dude, that's part of the mentorship. Also, don't 
everyone's looking for the work to the person above them to help them uh, guide them. But I have often found, and this is what I try to tell students, look to the guys to the left and right of you who are who are doing some some great things. And even though they may have not achieved the, the level of success of, say, a Spike Lee or a Sam Jackson type of thing yet, they have some elements that will help may help elevate you that you can learn under, even though they're on the same level for the most part. I'll be honest with my good buddy, uh, nephew Tommy, uh, incredibly successful at what he's doing. And Tommy and I always talk about what are the elements of success. One of the first things that Tommy talked about, he said, man, yo, this is when I was back. I had a flip phone back in the day. And he was like, yo, you got to get your communications together, brother. You're right. Um, that was just, and that's a friend, you know, but so mentorship does not necessarily have to come in the traditional way that you think of the wizened old veteran taking you under their wing. But rather, like I said, the two things I said, go seek their wisdom that's placed somewhere else, like in a book, mm. and recognize that wisdom can occur on the same level that you are, but somebody that's that, that's equally or, or doing something. There's another guy, Paul Davis incredibly successful as, as, as an entertainment producer. I'm always calling Paul, hey man, how do you do this? How does this happen? How do you, how do, how do you make this um, occur in your life? And Paul is dropping gems and wisdom all the time. So, so, so this is what I'm saying. Mentorship is not this uh, uh, um, staid sort of traditional, like, you know, uh, um, situation, but rather it is it is it is something that you can seek out in ways that are that that, you, that are unexpected for most people. But you, I want you all, whoever's listening to this or watching this, to follow, listen to what I'm saying on this. In a book, look at the people to your left and to your right who are doing well, and there's your mentor. There are your mentors. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. Not necessarily the Jedi Padawan relationship. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's right. You said it better. That is so true. I love that. Right. That was, yeah, just, you must be a geek. He's, who knows Padawan? Right, right. There I mean, the first thing I wrote was sci fi, too. So we got it is. Okay. Comment. I'm just saying. <laughs> right. So, can you share any insights into the collaborative process of writing and filmmaking, and how have your collaborations enriched your creative endeavors? Um, greatly enrich them uh, because I love to surround myself with people who are creative. Um, uh, my wife is a writer also, and it's fun to sort of bounce stories off of her. And um, I have, um, like I said, I have some good buddies who are, who are in the, uh, Th Thomas Miles calls me up and he's like, hey, I got this idea. Or the same thing, I'll pitch him back an idea. So we're constantly doing stuff. So look for big things from us in the future. All right, so because we have tons of ideas out there. Um, so in other words, as writers, be careful about trying to be this, um, uh, uh, going to your cocoon and then just working and think one day I will open up in my butt uh, like a butterfly, you know, that cocoon, you be look up and the world has gone by you. You better start talking to people. You better share. Don't be afraid to share ideas. Everybody's so worried about their, um, he had long, <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> So lastly, what words of encouragement or advice do you have for aspiring writers and filmmakers who may be facing challenges in pursuing their dreams? Um, get some education, you know, um, and, and that education doesn't have to be formal. I'm not saying you have to go to film school or be in a film program. But like I said, there are books and YouTube videos out there where you can learn from to learn. Don't be afraid of that. Um, that, that's one of the big things. Secondly, it's just do it. You know, I mean, Nike says best, just do it. And what does that mean? Start just, just right. It doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, heck, you know, nothing is ever perfect when you first put it down, but it's the act of creating that, that will make it, it move it towards perfection. So, so do the work and don't look at it. Let's take the word work off. Let's do it because you love it. It's fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Avery, my associate friend. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Today, and thanks to everyone who uh, joined us for the Impact Virtual Speaker Series. Thanks again to the incomparable Jaylee, 
Jaylene Mack from Jaylene Mac Mack. Yes, thank you, Jaylene. Yes. Yes, Mack Performing Arts Collective, and to our sponsor, Country Financial. And thanks to you who came and joined us today via your phone, your laptop, your iPad, or whatever. Go out and have yourself a wonderful day. All right. Thank you, Allie. Appreciate Bye. you. All right, you all. Bye bye. This is Thomas Miles, nephew Tommy from the Steve Harvey Morning Show. As a radio personality, comedian, actor, and producer, I know what type of hard work and dedication it takes to make an impact in the world of arts and entertainment. Mac Performing Arts Collective, a nonprofit for visual and performing arts, is doing just that. Impact's mission is to cultivate the interests of visual and performing arts by exposing, educating, and entertaining. Impact is dedicated to the formation of avenues into the professional world of arts and entertainment through several of its programs, including It's a Wrap, Playhouse Theater, and Impact Jazz. Through these programs, Impact has launched film festivals, TV forums, music symposiums, comedy series, and showcases, jazz shows, theater productions, acting and comedy workshops, and much, much more. All in an effort to create platforms for emerging talent and create access to industry insiders in an effort for those seeking careers in arts and entertainment to be successful. As a proud member of its advisory board, I would like you to support Impact as a volunteer or as a donor. Please visit impact-arts.org today.